You're listening to the Patenting for Inventors podcast with registered patent attorney, Dr. Adam Diamond, founder of Diamond Patent Law, the number one source for securing your intellectual property needs. Now, here's your host, Adam Diamond. Hello, and welcome to the Patenting for Inventors podcast, episode 120, Quick Path Information Disclosure Statements. My name is Adam Diamond, a registered patent attorney and founder and owner of Diamond Patent Law in Los Angeles, California. I can be contacted through my website at diamondpatentlaw.com. That's D-I-A-M-E-N-T patentlaw.com or call me at 424-281-0162. Now this episode is not for beginners. If this is your first episode that you've ever heard from me, I doubt you will ever want to listen to another one because this is really wonky and specific. And if you ever want to know why your patent attorney charges so much money for what seems so simple, then maybe you'll like this, or you just like to know the nitty-gritty details of what patent attorneys do all day. So with that disclaimer, this episode is about cupids. Now, I know what you're thinking. What do patents have to do with a kid in a diaper shooting arrows? Well, it's not that kind of cupid. Cupids in the patent world is an acronym for Quick Path Information Disclosure Statement. Now, I'm sure you've memorized all my episodes so far, but just in case you haven't, I would recommend going back to episode 24. It was a long time ago, and that was just about information disclosure statements in general. As a quick review, what an information disclosure statement is, is that it's a document that you have to give to the patent office where you disclose any prior art, those are previous references, uh, before you things that came out before your patent application, that would be material to the patentability of your invention. Now, going back to the invention I used that I used to talk about a lot, the three-in-one avocado splitter, pitter, and slicer, let's say lots of two-in-one avocado slices already existed, and you came up with the three-in-one avocado slicer. Now, it might be material to the patentability of your invention that a two-in-one already exists. Now, you're not saying that you shouldn't get a patent. Obviously, you're filing a patent application, so you think you should. But some people might think that it's material to the patentability of your invention, so you have to disclose it. And you're probably thinking, I don't want to disclose it. I don't want the patent office even knowing that there are similar things out there. I totally get where you're coming from. I wouldn't want them to know either. But the rule is that you have to disclose it. And if you don't disclose it, and later on it's found out in litigation or some other situation where you knew that there was something similar out there and you never disclosed it, then your patent is unenforceable. And if you're an attorney trying to hide information, then you can get disbarred or suspended. So if I know that you're trying to hide something, I can't hide it for you because I'm not going to get disbarred just because you want to hide something. So it's always better to disclose everything that even is remotely uh, related to your invention just to be safe. So in episode 24, I talked about information disclosure statements in general and when you have to pay to fill one out and when you don't have to pay to fill one out. One important thing to know is that you have a duty to disclose all the way until your patent issues. Once your patent issues, you no longer have a duty to disclose any information. Filing a late information disclosure statement is perfectly normal. Maybe you had no idea this two-in-one avocado slicer existed, then all of a sudden you see this two-in-one slicer. Once you find out, then you disclose it. Another situation that can happen is that maybe you filed your patent application in lots of different countries. You might get a rejection from your Japanese patent application before you got one from your US application. You're going to have to disclose all the prior art references that the Japanese examiner found in rejecting your application to the US examiner. It can be a pain because you have to file a document in the US, and not only that, if you have applications all over all over the world, lots of countries have the same rule about disclosures. So you have to do lots of information disclosure statements. They're actually companies where one of the things they do is keep track of all the disclosures you made to the different pat- patent offices throughout the world. And if any new prior art comes up, they have a list of all the prior art disclosed and will prepare the statements for all the countries. Okay, so what is this quick path information disclosure statement and why did I separate it out here? Let's say you heard uh, heard from your US examiner and you got a notice of allowance. You're super excited, you pay the issue fee, and right after you pay the issue fee, you find out about some new prior art that you didn't know about. Maybe another country rejected your application, but you really don't think that it's relevant to you being able to get a patent in the US, but you have to disclose it. Normally, once you pay the issue fee, an examiner is not going to take into consideration any new information disclosure statement. And you don't want to withdraw your patent um, that's just about to issue because you still think that you should get a patent on your invention 
despite what this newly revealed prior art has in it. This is where the cupids comes in. It's a way to disclose this information to the patent office after you paid your issue fee, but before the patent actually issues. And it usually might issue about six weeks after you pay your issue fee. First, you're going to want to download a form called PTO SB09. It's called Certification and Request for Consideration of an Information Disclosure Statement After Payment of the Issue Fee under QPIDS Program. You put this, you put in your application number, inventor name, filing date, and the title of, title of the invention. Then there are seven statements, and you have to check uh, certain boxes and sign at the bottom. Uh, the first statement is saying that you're submitting an information disclosure statement and the issue fee uh, is being paid. Uh, in item two, you have to check uh, one of three boxes. Either you receive this new prior art, that's the reference that, you're, that you just came into uh, possession of, less than three months ago from a foreign patent office, or that it's not from a foreign patent office, but you didn't know about this prior art for more than three months. Or you can ask them to see an attached certification statement. And that certification statement would be on your regular information disclosure statement, which is on PTO, the form PTO SB08. In item three, you have to tell them to charge the information disclosure statement fee to your deposit account number, and you give that number. Uh, as an uh, individual, you might not have a deposit number. It's something that you set up with the patent office where you have to keep some money in an account just in case of, of emergencies usually. Uh, if you don't have one, you have to use an attorney uh, that does have one. Item four says you have to submit a web-based petition online in a certain way. The fifth item is to request a continued examination called an RCE, and you have to submit a fee for that. Sixth is that you are saying that this is a conditional request for a continued examination. What this means is that you're doing a request for a continued examination called an RCE, and I talked a lot about RCEs in previous episodes, and usually when the patent office has rejected your application twice, that's when you get an RCE. That's when, at this point, if you want to keep arguing about it to say that your invention is patentable, after two of the rejections, you have to pay some more fees uh, for the examiner to keep renewing it. And that's what's called a request for continued examination. Here, this is conditional, a conditional RCE, which is a little strange, but the reason is you're paying for an RCE, but once the examiner looks at that prior art, he might say, uh, you know what, thanks for the prior art, I looked at it, I don't think it's a big deal, you should still get a patent like I said the first time. If that happens, you actually get a refund from the patent office for the money that you paid for this RCE. If after you submit this new information, the examiner decides that you shouldn't get a patent and has to issue, issue you a rejection now, then you don't get a refund. And the seventh part is saying that you are filing this as a web-based e-petition uh, and you're not filing an amendment. If you file an amendment, it's as if you're doing a real RCE and, and that's not conditional and you don't get any refund no matter what. And at the bottom, you sign it. When you do this online, it's called an e-petition. You have to be a registered user uh, of the USPTO website. You select the button that says existing application slash patent. Then you select e-petition. You'll get some options and you select petition to withdraw from issue after payment of the issue fee. And then there are four possible items to check, from, check off from there. In two of those options, you haven't received your future patent number yet. And in the other two, you have received your patent number. You'll actually get a patent number before it actually issues. It's going to say, hey, this is going to issue in three weeks. This is what your patent number is going to be. So depending on uh, what stage you're at, um, you just have to select one of those options. And once you've narrowed it down to the two options that it would be, you probably want to pick the one that says that you are withdrawing under 37 CFR 1.313 C1 or C2. The other option is C3. You actually have to read the code to see which applies, but if you pick the one that says C3, that just means that you're expressly abandoning the application. My guess is that you probably don't want to do that. You're probably requesting withdrawal because of what C2 says, which is consideration of a request for continued examination. So you check that box. It's probably going to be the first or third option on the screen, but you, re you really have to read it in case they've changed the order. Let's assume you check the box, then a new window uh, will pop up and ask you to put in your application number and confirmation number. The confirmation number is on every document you get from the patent office for that particular application. And then you have to click the box for the reason for withdrawal. And you check the box that says either uh, one or more claims are unpatentable or consideration of a request for continued examination. 
if you're doing this because of everything I've talked about so far in this episode, it's going to be consideration of request for a continued examination. The next screen that you'll, uh, you'll see, you'll select that you want consideration of a request for continued examination. And assuming you haven't filed any documents before for this request, you're going to want to select the option that says RCE request submission and fee are attached. Then you check your entity status, which is going to be a large, small, or micro. Listen to my episodes on entity status if you want to know what you are. Then you sign and you put your name on it. After that, you get to a screen where you have to attach your documents. You have to submit the request for continued examination, which is PTO SB 30, the information disclosure statement, and the form that you filled out for the quick path information disclosure statement. Uh, the category dropdowns for all of these is going to be under petition. Then you click the upload and validate button. After that, you'll get to a fee calculation page where you'll select petition fees and you'll have to pay the petition fee under 37 CFR 1.17H group three. I told you this is gonna be a wonky episode, uh, not for the faint of heart here. So um, there's a lot of different codes to read and the, the fees will change. So I don't even wanna go into what the fees might be. Um, and it really depends on the size of your, your company or your, you know, how much income you make. And, uh, the fees are always, you know, going up or down depending on various things. Uh, so you'll just have to select which apply to you and it will pick the correct fee for you. Um, and then you submit the, uh, you do the request for examination fee, you hit continue. Uh, then you can pay by credit card. You do need a deposit number, um, for your deposit account but I believe that you don't need that to actually pay it. I believe the reason they actually want the deposit account is that for the possible refund that I talked about, if the examiner still allows uh, your patent, you get a refund of the request for continued examination fee. So all this is just to say that um, it does get a little bit difficult if you do find out information kind of at the last second before your patent issues. Hopefully it doesn't happen, uh, but if it does, there is a way to comply with all the rules and your duty to disclose and all that kind of good stuff. Um, I can definitely help out with that if there's ever an issue that you come across that is related to this. And if you want help with your patent application, trademarks, copyrights, responding to rejections, appeals, anything else related to your invention, you can contact me directly through my website at diamondpatentlaw.com. That's D-I-A-M-E-N-T, patentlaw.com. Email me at adam at diamondpatentlaw.com or call me at 424-281-0162. I'm Adam Diamond, and until next time, keep on inventing. Thanks for listening to the Patenting for Inventors podcast with host Adam Diamond. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review on iTunes. The contents of this podcast are intended for general informational purposes only. The facts of every legal matter are unique and the content of this podcast should not be construed as offering legal advice for your specific legal situation. For more information and help with your own intellectual property needs, contact Adam Diamond at patentingforinventors.com. That's patentingforinventors.com or call Diamond Patent Law at 424-281-0162. The preceding information may be considered an attorney advertisement and does not establish any attorney-client relationship.